What's up, first students? I'm super excited to be with you tonight um, in a way that's different from what we're used to. Um, but hey, this is going to be pretty normal for the next few weeks. And so I hope that you'll get excited and that you'll continue to follow along as we see what it's like to worship together online. So today, I'm going to bring the one-man panel to you. I promised you that we would do a panel, even though uh, we're not able to do it the way we originally intended to. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not three married couples, but I am one married man, and I'm excited to show you what the Bible says about relationships, love, sex, marriage. And so join me now in this panel, and uh, let's see what happens. Okay. The host and the panel, all in one. Question number one. How do you find the balance between your boyfriend slash girlfriend and your friends? Very good question. And before we talk about balancing anything, we need to talk about are the friends you have worth balancing? Um, and by that I mean this. Are your friends wise? Are they people who, um, if you're a believer, are believers as well who are on the same path as you are going after the same Jesus um, and trying to do the same kind of things that you are or are they foolish and well, I use that word because the Bible uses that word in this scripture Proverbs thirteen twenty says this the one who walks with the wise will become wise but a companion of fools will suffer harm so if you don't have friends who are wise um, I would encourage you to seek after those kind of friends, friends who are believers as well, who are, uh, who are interested in serving the same God that you are. Um, and two, if you don't have those friends, I'm not giving you an excuse to spend all of your time with your boyfriend or your girlfriend um, because that's not how it works. And so let me give you some practical advice about how important it is to actually have a life outside of your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Um, let me share with you a story from my personal life. Not really a story, just some experience from my personal life. Uh, I'm married now to my beautiful wife, Janae, um, but we weren't always married, believe it or not. And we dated, just like many of you are dating now. And uh, in college, actually, where we started dating, um, I, was, I was confused at one point in my relationship because Janae would oftentimes ask for time alone or time to spend with her family or time just to spend with her girlfriends, and she didn't want to hang out with me. And at first, that made me really nervous and, and confused, like, what did I do wrong? You know, what is happening? Um, but as I uh, began to have conversations with her and um, conversations with some of my mentors, and, and s after I sought some wise counsel about why is this happening, I began to realize that it's important for her and for me to have time outside of the, of the romantic relationship um, with our family, with our friends, with ourselves. That's important. That's, that is something that you should want in a relationship. And so um, I think back to that time in my life, and I realized that I was fortunate enough to have a good core group of guy friends who were believers as well, who were encouraging me, who challenged me in my faith. Um, and when Janae didn't want to or wasn't hanging out with me, it was very easy for me to go hang out with those friends and to, um, to find community in them. And I think back and I, and I wonder what it would have been like had I not had those friends. And so that brings me to this next point. Don't be that guy or that girl who after a breakup or in the middle of a breakup, you go looking for that friend group you used to have and they're no longer there, right? We all know somebody who's been in that situation. We, we've had a friend who has done this to us maybe um, and it's a sad thing to see and it's a tough thing to deal with when you've abandoned your friends, you've neglected them and they're no longer there when you finally want to go back to them uh, for some comfort, for some, some help in whatever area of your life. And... Um, on the flip side of that, let me say this. If you know, uh, you see a friend who's going down that path, who's neglecting your group of friends, show them some love. Be gracious to them. Um, open their eyes. Maybe try to get them to understand maybe what could happen in the future, that they're still going to want to need that core group of friends uh, if this relationship they're in ends, or even if it doesn't end. It's still good to have that group of friends. And so um, that's how you would balance uh, between a boyfriend a girlfriend and your other friends, family, your alone time? It's important. It's a good question. Thank you for asking it. Next question. This is a good one. This is an important one. How do you get over your ex, especially if you've done sexual things with them? So first and foremost, I need you to understand this. Guys and girls both, 
If you have ever done something uh, sexual with somebody, you need to understand that the God I serve is a forgiving God. Um, and you can have that forgiveness too through relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, and so don't ever think because you've already committed this sin, because you've already made this mistake that there's no hope for you, uh, that God I- doesn't love you because he does. In fact, he knew that you were going to mess up in that way. He knows that we are all sinners, that we all mess up. And so understand that he loves you, that there's still hope, that it's never too late to start fresh, to repent from that sin, to turn from it, and to be- begin uh, creating a different standard, a different expectation in your relationships that you have. Um, and, and, and two, once you realize um, that you've made this mistake, that it's not something that you want con- to continue doing, it's important that you grow from that, right? That you, uh, out of that, begin to set those new boundaries and those new expectations. As this question suggests, uh, it does make things more difficult. Um, it makes creating new boundaries and new habits difficult if you've already entered into those sexual uh, relations. And that's hard, that's, that's, that's a struggle, um, but I can tell you that, that you can get to that point. And if you can't, if the other person in the relationship is um, you know, giving you pushback, they're, they're making it to where those new boundaries and habits that you are trying to instill just can't happen, get out of the relationship. So here's some practical advice to getting over your ex. Uh, just some simple things. Distance yourself as much as possible. Um, forgiveness on your end is very good. It's very helpful in that. Uh, prayer for a closure for both of you on both ends of that relationship is good. And then really what it all boils down to is, is finding the confidence in what God says is supposed to happen in a relationship. What God says um, he has in store for you. What God uh, wants for you in your life. That's what it really boils down to. Finding your confidence in, in God and what he calls you to be and what he calls you to do. Um, and again, if the person, the ex in this, in this relationship is uh, just lingering, do your best, right, to, to get out of it by the distance, by, by, by the forgiveness, by the prayer. But a big, big help in this is surrounding yourself with other people who are like-minded, other believers, other people who uh, will encourage you and help you to uphold these new standards, these new habits that you seek after, right? Um, and let me, let me give you some scripture on that. Uh, surrounding yourself with good people who who have the same values and morals and beliefs as you is very, very important. So let's look at th- uh, what the scripture says about this. First, Philippians 2, 4. It says, everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And so for you, maybe you are looking out for uh, the other person's interests, and that's maybe why you're holding on to that X and it's difficult to get over. But remember, too, that your own interests, your own beliefs are important. And so don't compromise for somebody else. And then another verse, Galatians 6, 2, is this. Carry one another's burdens, and this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And that's the good friends. Those are the the Christ-like friends that I'm talking about uh, when I say surround yourself with good people. If you are going to be a a Christian, uh, God calls you to, to carry one another's burdens, right? If you have a brother or a sister in Christ, you are too. To hurt when they hurt, you mourn when they mourn. You lift each other up in that season. And so that's why it's important to have those people around you so they can help you with that burden. Encourage you to move on past that to bigger and better things that God has in store. That's question number two. Good question. Number three. How do you get a guy to stop wanting sex considering you've already done these things before and now you have stopped and you refuse to do it again. First, let me say again, what a great choice to stop doing that. Um, Never too late. It's never too far gone. You can always start those new habits, those new uh, boundaries in your relationship. And so, good for you. But as this question suggests, it can be, again, more difficult, right, to, to stop these sexual things from happening when you've already done them. Um, but don't let that discourage you because it is possible. And if the, again, if the person in the relationship makes it impossible, get out of the relationship. Two, and this is just plain, plain and simple, you will not be able to stop a guy from wanting sex. If you were here last week, we talked about um, the boy's nature, the man's nature is very, very sexually driven and much more so than a woman. Uh, and so to, to literally stop them from that desire is not going to happen. 
Um, but you can, as a couple or as one half of a couple, do things that um, put you in better situations, that sets you up for success, knowing that you both struggle in that area. So one, one real practical way is be intentional on where, when, and how you two are hanging out, right? Put yourself in a situation that is set up to um, get you as far away from that temptation as possible. Have an honest discussion with that person. Um, set those boundaries. Make those expectations. And if they disagree with them, again, find confidence in what God says and get out of that relationship. That's number three. Good question. Next question. How can I lead a guy to Jesus? How can I lead a guy to Jesus? So let me be clear in saying that dating romantically with the intention of converting them, of leading them to Christ, is not a good idea. Um, and here's why. Let me just go straight to the scripture for this one. Second Corinthians six fourteen says this. Don't become partners with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness, light and darkness? So this is one translation, but some translations of the Bible, when you read this verse, will use uh, the word yoke. Um, so it, it's essentially saying don't be with somebody who is not of equal yoke. Um, if you are unequally yoked, you don't need to be in a relationship. And so what that yoked means, uh, it goes back to the Old Testament. And there's a, a story of an ox and a donkey who are sharing the same harness, pulling the same plow. And it tells us that these two are clearly unequally yoked, right? The ox is built different from the donkey and vice versa. They have different nature. They have a different mindset, right? The ox is strong and the donkey is not quite as strong. And they, the one is more stubborn than the other. One wants to go this way. One wants to go that way. And it tells us that that's going to be one of the most uneven plow lines you've ever seen, right? That's not a good idea. And so it's telling us here in 2 Corinthians, the same is true of our relationships, right? If, you, if a believer and a non-believer in Jesus are trying to work together to work as one in a relationship, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't work quite as well as it's supposed to, as it's designed to. And here's, a, here's an interesting point that I want you to get to. The only reason, the only purpose for us to have any kind of relationship, friendship, uh, romantic relationship, whatever it may be, the only reason that we enter into any kind of relationship is to glorify God. That's it. That's the only reason. And so if you have a believer and a non-believer trying to go after that one uh, goal of glorifying God, one person is not on board. And so it begins to push and pull one way or another, and it makes things very difficult. The Bible's clear. A believer should be with a believer. That's how it goes. Um, and then, too, let me give you a little bit of, uh, of hope, maybe. If you are dead set on, on dating somebody who is not a believer, and you are, um, you don't have to give up hope, right? If you, if you think, oh, my gosh, they're perfect, we're going to get married, here's what you can do. You can maintain the friendship and share Christ with them. When the opportunities arise, share the gospel with those people. And, two, live a life that shows them the love of Jesus, and hey, maybe, maybe one day they'll believe in Jesus and you guys can get married and, and have all the kids that you want. It'll be great, right? But until then, I, I would encourage you um, just to be a friend and show them who Christ is through your lifestyle. All right, that is question number four. And it's a good question. Thanks for asking. Next and final question. This is, this is maybe my favorite because it's kind of funny. Is there sex in heaven? And there's actually an answer to that. Some people are like, oh, I don't know. Well, we don't know what heaven's going to be like. Well, we don't know a whole lot. But there's actually a scripture that tells us um, the answer to this question. And it is in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. It says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So a little background on this verse. Uh, Jesus is talking to the Sadducees and and they're asking all these questions. Uh, they've been told, there's seven brothers, right? And they've been told that the Bible says if, if one brother dies and he has a wife, one of the brothers needs to marry that wife and help raise the children. And, and that's besides the point. But their, their question is this. When we get to heaven, who gets to marry the wife? Uh, and that's kind of a funny question, but Jesus answers and tells them what I just told you, right? When you get to heaven, you're not going to be married. And you're not going to be married. You're not going to enter into a marriage when you get to heaven, uh, besides being married to Christ, of course. And so 
here's the thing. The Bible's clear that sex is for marriage. It's for one man, one woman who are entered together, who become one in marriage. That is what sex is for. And so guess what? No sex, no marriage. Hold on a second. Let's flip those. So, so marriage comes before sex. So no marriage, no sex. All right, we can continue. It's a very, very clear-cut thing. Um, but let me, let me also tell you this. Um, although here on earth we think sex is like the greatest thing ever, like it is, it's what we desire the most in our life. For one, it's not. There's a lot better things out there than that. God did create it for us. He did create it for, for our enjoyment for, for so many different reasons to, to ri- obviously reproduce. There's all kinds of reasons that we look forward to, to sex. But here's the thing. When you get to heaven, if you're a believer in Christ, and, and when that time comes, whether it's the resurrection or, or however you get there, right, you're not going to think too much about sex because you're going to finally be face-to-face with Jesus. You're going to be in the presence of the one who died for you, right, the one who understands how you are sinful and how you cannot be perfect, but with him there is hope. And you're going to be so focused on him and the fact that you get to live eternally with him Sex is going to be nothing. It's going to be super minute. And so, hey, don't worry about it, all right? Heaven's, heaven's got a whole lot more for us to look forward to than just sex, all right? That's number five. Good question. Thanks for asking. And that's it for the questions. Let me tell you, I'm super, super excited for what we're going to do moving forward. I'm so glad that you joined us tonight, and I hope that you'll continue uh, to check your social media and, and interact with us in this way. I love you guys. And remember that relationships are good. Love is good. Marriage is good. Sex is a good thing. God created all of these things. But before you enter into those things, check what God says about those. What does the Bible say about a relationship, about love, marriage, and sex? Check it with the Bible. Check it with God first. And then move forward in the way that he wants you to. See you guys soon.